Thank you so much. Please welcome Sandro Kopp. Put away our accessories. Welcome. Hi. Thank you very much for having me. Welcome, everyone. Um, Sandro, I haven't been on this stage with an audience, or maybe at all, since March 4th of 2020. We're sitting right there was Daniel Craig <laughs> talking about a movie that came out this week. <laughs> so it's been quite a ride. This film was also meant to come out uh, a lot earlier, um, but we're so thrilled that we could be here to help put it out into the world and um, to talk this evening about an element of the film that was completely unexpected to me when I first saw it. Um, and immediately something I knew that I wanted to dig deeper into, and that of course were your paintings uh, for the film. So let's put up an image, I'll click on the first one. We can pull up that first slide. Uh, let's go back, there we go. That's the first one we see. So it seems to me that this was a very tricky assignment uh, because when we first experience the portrait of Simon, it, it almost has to hit a beat where it's kind of funny and absurd, and then immediately shift into something, wait, wait a minute, no, 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 this is actually kind of serious. This is something compelling. What, what was Wes's first instruction to you? Do you remember when you, when you first talked about what he might want out of these portraits? It was pretty clear that they were going to be relatively abstract, and he knew that the little one was supposed to be black and flesh, and that the big ones were going to be orange and flesh. Everything else was unclear. He just had a relatively um, clear idea of what he wanted them to be, but not how they were going to get to there. And we tried out a lot of stuff along the way. I mean, we we spent... Um, I was traveling, and so I spent a couple of months traveling before I could get to Angoulême, where we just emailed back and forth, and I was making sketches and doing designs and had all these ideas about what they were going to be. And then finally I arrived, and I had three months to make those paintings. And um, I was very, very keen to get started, because I knew that was a very short period of time to make something that looked like it was supposed to have taken three years. And Wes was like, no, 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 no. We're going to do a test. And um, he said, just figure out how you're going to paint flesh. Do a little panel this big and do flesh. Go. So I did it. I was like, OK, here. Let's start now. Let's start on the big ones. And he said, no, 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 do it again. But this time, do it a little bit differently. This time, make the shapes sort of more detailed, um, and this went on for almost a month of going, no, nope, do it again, this time, you know, light it on fire, this time attack it with a knife, this time use only geometric shapes, no round lines. It was, it was very, very just trying everything. And then finally we had something that was like, oh no, this sort of works, now do one full size, which is five by 10 feet for each of the big panels. And that became the first panel. He came and he was like, yep, this is, this is going to work. Now I'll do another one. And then eight more. Um, the far more challenging one actually was this one. Yeah. The so this was one. not the first one. This was not the first one, no. This came very late. And there was always, of course, as when you're doing a film, you have the date when something needs to be shot. So you know very, very clearly when something needs to be finished by. And we, I'd done nine versions of Simone Naked Cell Block J Hobby Room. And I liked several of those very much. Wes was not so sure about them. And then it was sort of the weekend, and he said, um, it's one of these two, but I think this one. Let's talk again on Monday. I came in on Monday. The painting was gone. The schedule had changed. They were already shooting it. <laughs> and I was sort of quite um, devastated that I didn't get to finish it. But in the time since, I've actually changed my perspective on it and have gone, no, it, 
it works. It does what it should. And it's good that it's kind of unfinished because it starts it all off. Exactly. So let's rewind to the beginning of this. Um, you're not an unexperienced person when it comes to filmmaking. You have spent a lot of time on sets in different capacities yep. as, as uh, an artist, a visual artist contributing in terms of your painting, but also in terms of your photography. Yep. Um, so what is your process of integrating into a set? Um, you know, what we see as an audience generally is um, what we see and hear are the results of actors in front of the camera, the work of the camera people, the sound of the composers and the sound engineers, but we don't often think about the folks who create the, the atmosphere or capture the atmosphere. Talk to us over the years, how have you found a way to, to join that family, join that gang? Well, that's exactly it. Painting is a relatively solitary thing to do. It's usually you and maximum one other person sitting for you or maybe a couple. And as a creative person, I think working collaboratively is super inspiring and important. And I love filmmaking for the fact that you have all these people from the drivers and the caterers and the riggers and lighting people who are all working towards the moment when they call the roll and everything goes quiet and they start shooting. And I want that. So this is what drew me to film for a long time. Plus, I love film. I mean, I'm a big film nerd myself, and as well as a painting nerd. But um, it was a very um, fortunate thing that the opportunity to make these paintings, which are quite different to the stuff that I usually make, was sort of exactly the, the thing that I needed to paint for myself anyway at this point in my life. So. Yeah, I was going to recommend, if you haven't seen Luca Guadagnino's Suspiria, what a perfect month to see that film. And uh, one of, at least one of your paintings features extremely prominently uh, in that. So you could, and it is quite different um, in terms of its realism. Um, yeah. yeah. So, I did all the, I mean, I think one of the reasons why Wes wanted me was because I, he also knew that I could do figurative stuff. So all the young Rosenthaler stuff I was able to, to do as well and then going forward into making the big paintings. He also wanted me to hand double Tony Revolori. So all the shots where <laughs> they're in the train car or in the bar, that's my hand poking through Tony's sleeve doing the <laughs> actual painting, which was difficult because his hair's so big and I sort of had to judge when he was actually looking at the painting from the movement of the hair against my face. So, so did you get your SAG card for like the hand double? No, no. no. <laughs> so let's go through um, the connections and direct collaborators you probably had, most prominently, mm -hmm. obviously, Lea Seydoux, um, yes. who plays Simone. Um, I had the extreme privilege of meeting and dining with uh, Lea recently, and we actually were able to talk a little bit so I could do some prep for this conversation. Um, and she was effusive about um, the working with you and, and actually sitting for you, but talk to me about how much there was actually of your time with her, um, either beforehand, during, or, or on set, um, and how that would relate to your normal, your normal um, practice. It was difficult because we had to prepare early on before she was in Angoulême. I went up to Paris one day and took photos, and for Wes's films, usually you have an animated guide where the entire film is already extant in very roughly but beautifully animated uh, frames with him doing all the voices, which is brilliant. And um, so we knew most of the poses that she was going to be taking for the paintings. And so I was able to photograph her in those poses and then develop that further with where suggesting other poses. And all the big ones started completely figurative. There's a body in each of them. And um, they became more and more abstracted as we went along. And um, Whenever we came to a point when I wasn't sure whether to maybe leave something, there was a hand that I really liked, there was a foot that I liked or something, I'd write to Wes with a photo and say, should I keep this? Should we keep this one here? And he'd always say the same thing. He'd say, paint it out, Sandro, but I like that you know that it's there. So they're all there. And there is one ear that actually remained in the rightmost panel of the 10 of Leia's ear. Um, and then she's sat for me when she came to Angoulême as well, but it was, it was mainly photos of her and um, also for the Simone painting. 
in the animatic, actually, the pose is different. So at a certain point, my my painting switched from that pose to what she actually does in the in the frame, which is incredible acrobatics on her part. Um, let's talk about uh, Mr. Rosenthaler, Moses Rosenthaler, Benicio del Toro. Uh, uh, did you <laughs> did you have any moment where you could infuse a little bit of Sandro into his character in terms of I mean, I know he's very specific and not at all like you. I have the privilege of knowing you for many, many years. But was there any, any of the artists um, that you helped infuse into that character? Again, it was really all in the script. I mean, it's very much Wes's decision. We both got a beard. Maybe that's a <laughs> thing. I don't know. Um, and Benicio, the day that he arrived in Angoulême, came right away to the studio to look at how far I'd gotten. At that point, I think we had two of the paintings done. And we played around and threw some handfuls of paint at some boards and he sort of got into it. But he had a pretty clear idea of what he was going to do with the part. And I think Wes had an even clearer idea. So that was in there, but it's perfect. All right. And then we'll wrap with your curator, of course. <laughs> <laughs> what a performance. So J.K.L. Berenson, this is a character based on a woman who I am quite convinced must have worked at this museum in the late 50s or 60s. I mean, her, that high mid-Atlantic, kind of accessible, kind of snobbery, um, definitely the mid-speech drink, all of that I recognize in descriptions of former colleagues. So there is a <laughs> an authenticity and, um, but also the approachability. I mean, I love that Wes has set this as, as a Midwestern tale, right? This is not a, a you know, a, a New York elitist uh, publication, although many of the writers were, you know, um, writers for The New Yorker. Um, but tell us anything you can uh, describe about the relationship or translating the way that Tilda translates these paintings for an audience. Well, the, the writer that her character is based on is uh, Rosamond Bernier. Who, uh, did she work here? She I probably was here. She Somebody definitely was, was here. Knew, I, don't I don't know. <laughs> and um, the performance started there, but then Tilda took it to a completely new and higher place. And I get such a thrill out of watching it over and over again. I remember the day that they came back with the rushes, two days after we shot it in Angoulême, and we were just sitting in the cutting room watching every take over and over again because she did something different with every single take. It was incredible. We shot the whole auditorium scene in one day. That's like six minutes of the film oh my that we do, did in one day. And it was extraordinary. I mean, so wonderful. And she just took it to a new, different flourish every time. Um, we artists, we all need someone who gets what we're doing. And so I'm, I, find, I find the whole story very moving, actually. Like, it's, it's good. This is also the fourth time that I've seen the film. And for all of you who've seen it for the first time, which is probably most of you, it gets better and better. It's like sucking on this concentrated n nutrition that you need to un <laughs> unfurl more and more. And every time I see more details, yeah. and every time it's somehow also more touching. I, I have seen it now and repeated, um, and it's absolutely true. The nuance comes through, or you just kind of let your go, yourself go and, and dive into the chapters um, in, in different ways, but I have to say this chapter I found incredibly moving, probably because I work at this place and you know, I'm infused in it. Um, I want to talk a little bit specifically about your methodology of how you created these paintings, because in your um, Instagram post about coming here, there is this beautiful shot of your hand covered in the paint uh, of the paintings. Was there finger paint action actually a part of this? Oh, yeah. <laughs> so talk to us about how you, I mean, now you've, you've described making these multiple times. You just, did you try multiple methods of applying paint to canvas in these? Well, we um, developed this material which was supposed to look somewhat like oil paint, but also like shackle grease, pigeon blood, et cetera, et cetera, that uh, Berenson says is what Moses is using. And um, I have to give credit to my wonderful assistants, Sean Smith and Edith Baudron, who helped me a lot. And Edith particularly came up with this mixture of plaster and uh, uh, the stuff called Elastilux and so on, which we mixed up by the bucket load in varying consistencies. 
and you then had about a 20 minute window of malleability before it started to form a surface and dry. So each of them started with a very violent, intense, literally throwing paint down as, as, as fast as I can on top of the existing body that we'd mapped out with a projector beforehand. And um, then sometimes there were elements of anatomy. I don't know if you can tell. There's like a spine in that one, and there's a variety of three-dimensional or um, two-dimensional parts of the body. Sometimes it sort of goes into the body. Sometimes it comes out, and there are... I know where the bodies are buried. <laughs> and um, then it was simply a question of, of repeating that over and over until all the, to me, uh, until all the obstacles were removed that were stopping my eye from going around the painting so that every part of the painting could sort of refer to every other one as much as possible. Um, because of the extreme thickness of the paint, they were mainly painted lying down. They weren't frescoes like that. It would have been impossible to apply that amount of paint to a, a vertical surface. And then lots of washes and then always the attack with the knife. That was always the good moment when it started to dry, come in with the palette knife and stuff, slashing it, and um, then sometimes syringing bloody liquid into the slashes so that they'd come out. It was, it was really very, very enjoyable and um, exciting. I love, yeah, no, the physicality uh, is very seductive. Um, I just want to make a note um, that these are actually now on view, you mentioned earlier yes. this evening. So. Hasn't, hasn't opened yet. I don't know. It's been announced, but in London, if any of you are going there, at 180 The Strand, until I believe the 15th of November, all of those paintings are going to be shown alongside a bunch of sets that they've rebuilt, the amazing costumes by Milena Canonero, and um, finally the Sombla Cafe, where you can go and have a beer and a coffee at the end of the exhibition, is fully made there as well. But we're lucky we have you here with us. Um, and I'm, I'm glad they're actually able to be on view because there, there was that moment when Adrian punches it, you know, the gallerist punches the painting, and obviously at MoMA you don't punch paintings. Um, but I'm glad they're, they survived well enough to be on view. So I just want to um, end talking about your own personal work, the work that has nothing to do with um, your collaborative efforts on films. Um, both Lea Seydu and Bob Balban, who I saw this weekend out at the, the Hamptons Festival, um, where I was, yes, um, one of your, your gallerists in the film as well, um, both were like, oh, Sandro, I love him, I love him. You know, if he really likes you, he paints your eye. And I was like, I have my eye painted. Um, but talk to us about what you um, uh, are working on now and um, anything you'd like to share about your, your personal practice. Well. Generally, I do quite figurative work. I've been doing a lot more drawing since lockdown. That was my development there. I'm um, having a number of shows coming up, both of the more figurative stuff and the abstract stuff. What actually happened was that for the Simone Naked Salbotche Hobby Room, I wasn't so sure if that was the best version that I could do. Wes liked it, and when I saw the film for the first time, I was like, oh, the big ones are good, but that one I'm not sure. And he said, well, it's a square in the frame. If you can come up with something better, I'll put it in the film digitally. And um, he said, I like what's there, but impress me, and if, if it really is better, I'll change it. So I spent a year repainting that painting several dozen times over and over again. He didn't like any of them better. And I have come to really like what's in the film, but those several dozen paintings are going to be the basis of an exhibition in Berlin in probably early February next year. And um, yes, there's a show in London now. There's also going to be a variety of other shows in Germany next year, but you can find my uh, details on all the anti-social media and such things. Well, one thing we discovered in putting this evening together that, that you have a very tremendous and very determined fan base, uh, many of whom are here. I, Cop, cop heads, I guess cop coughs if you were German, but we were th thrilled to have all of you here with us for this conversation with Sandro. So Sandro Kopp, thank you so much for being thank here. Thank you Raj, thank you all, thank you very much.